Whether you're joining us here in person or online, I want to welcome you to another fantastic morning at First Mennonite Church, and also a celebration of Holy Humor Sunday. So hopefully our time spent together will be joyous, we'll, we'll crack some smiles, and, and worship the Lord at the same time. Um, as always, in the, in the post-Easter blahs, a chocolate Easter bunny was just not feeling himself. And so he made an appointment with his therapist. And as the day came, he went to the appointment and was greeted warmly by his therapist, lay down on the couch, and they began their session together. And the therapist, as I always do, asked, how are you feeling today? And the chocolate Easter bunny replied, I don't know, doc. I'm just feeling a little hollow inside. <laughs> At this time, I invite Pastor Laura up for some explanations and worship. So the idea of setting aside one Sunday every year to celebrate God's gift of laughter and joy may be new to some of us, but it's got a long and rich history in many congregations around the world. Laughter Sunday, also known as Holy Humor Sunday, Hilarity Sunday, God's Laughter Sunday, Bright Sunday, or Holy Fools Sunday, has its roots in a number of Christian traditions. Churches in 15th century Bavaria used to celebrate the Sunday after Easter as Rises Pascalis, or God's joke, or the Easter laugh. Priests would deliberately include amusing stories and jokes in their sermons in an attempt to make the faithful laugh. After the service, people would gather together to play practical jokes on one another and tell funny stories. It was their way of celebrating the resurrection of Christ, the supreme joke that God played on Satan by raising Jesus from the dead. The observance of Rises Pascalis was officially outlawed by Pope Clement X in the 17th century. Perhaps he thought people were having too much fun. In the Orthodox tradition, people would gather on Easter Monday to tell jokes and funny stories and to dance and eat together. In 1988, the Fellowship of Merry Christians began encouraging churches to resurrect some of these Christian traditions to celebrate the grace and mercy of God through the gift of laughter and joy. And today, Pastor Luke brings this tradition to us from his experiences growing up at Tabor Mennonite Church. So, in the spirit of resurrection, I'll offer you this one. A pastor was speaking to a group of second graders about the resurrection of Jesus when one student asked, what did Jesus say right after he rose from the grave? The pastor explained that the Gospels do not tell us exactly what he said. Then the hand of one little girl shot up and she said, I know what he said, I know what he said. He said, ta-da! Well, we're going to start off this morning by singing God of Wonder. Uh, go ahead and stand if you're able and join us. Um, I'm only going to tell one, but my current favorite dad joke is, why did the old man fall down the well? I don't know, Ben. Why did the old man fall down the well? Because he didn't see that well. Uh. Of water and sky, 
I think I'm up next. Go ahead, go ahead and have a seat. Uh, please join me in the call to worship. Our call to worship today is going to be a response. Um, I will do the one, and you may respond with the many. Sing a new song. Sing praise to our still laughing Easter God. Immerse your anxiety and despair in the fountain of new birth. For God has taken ordinary things and made them extraordinary. Sing a new song. Please bow your heads in prayer with me. Holy God, as you have taken what we call an absurdity, and turned it into a possibility, as you have coaxed us to sing springtime alleluias, where once there was a gray dawn, as you have called us out of the tombs we inhabit into an undreamed of tomorrow, we praise you for this day. Come, risen Christ, in newness and hope on this Eastertide day. Amen. We're going to have you stand back up again, uh, and we'll sing I Looked Up together.
At this time, I invite the children to come forward for the children's time. Now, you may all notice I'm not Andrea Regeer. She is home with her son, Charlie, today, but she recorded a message for all of you that we are going to get to enjoy on the screen up there. So I'm going to let uh, our friend Alex get us started with Andrea's children's time for us. Good morning, everyone. Hi. We're talking about something really fun, and I wish I could be there in person. The question today is, does God have a sense of humor? Did Jesus have a sense of humor? I believe so. I have lots of reasons to think so, um, from things I've read in the Bible and from experiences in my own life. But today, I, I have chosen to use the animal kingdom to prove my point that God does have a sense of humor and loves to make us laugh and to delight us with colors and interesting surprises. Let's look at the first animal, <laughs> the proboscis monkey. I love this guy. These monkeys are great. Look at those big brown eyes. That just looks like a lovable, sweet creature from Southeast Asia. The red-lipped batfish. This is an interesting crustacean that lives on the bottom of the ocean and walks around on those little legs that you can see underneath the creature. Look at those little whiskers. <laughs> that's, that's funny. And then that little mouth, that red, those red lips. Apparently they attract fish and fish come in because they're curious. And then the red-lipped batfish just eats them up. That's a beautiful thing that God created. The star-nosed mole that lives in our country, in the eastern states, and in Canada. Look at that cool creature. What are those little things in front of its face? Those little thing, they're, they're finger-like appendages um, that help the mole to feel around. Apparently those little finger-like things are um, six times more sensitive than the human hand. And moles are in the Guinness Book of World Records as being the world's fastest forager, even though they're underground and it's totally dark and they're not using vision, they can use their nose and their sense of, their sense of smell and their sense of touch to find food 
faster than any other critter. This is my favorite um, humorous animal, the shoebill in East Africa. I love its little tuft of hair in the back. I love its big bill. And my amazing God created that. Look at that side profile of the, sh of the shoe bill. It even looks like the shoe bill is laughing. I love that bill. And then look at the feathers on the back. They almost look like a cartoon character, doesn't it? And this is the full shoe bill in all of its beautiful glory. It just makes you smile. God is an amazing creator. Okay, who can tell me what this animal is? Did I hear someone say whale? Yes, it's a blue whale and it is the world's largest mammal. Look how big it is compared to those buildings behind it. It's huge. I can't remember, it's as, it's as big as, I think it's 13 school buses long, I think. I read that one time. Um, blue whales are amazing. All whales are actually amazing. And um, it turns out that they can communicate with each other across entire oceans. In fact, even farther than an entire ocean. Up here. It's 13,000 miles. And I could be wrong, but I think from North America to Europe, it's like 4,000 miles. I might, but anyway, they can communicate to each other over vast distances and humans can't even we we can't hear it the sound is much lower than we can hear so isn't that an interesting concept that there are sounds that we can't hear and colors that we as humans can't see but that and but that some animals can see and that some animals can hear god is an amazing creator Okay, what's this animal? Elephant. For a long time, we thought we knew all the sounds that elephants could make. And we thought they did a lot of, they spent a lot of time just standing around, staring at each other. Well, recently, um, a scientist was in, in, on the, in the savannah and she was sitting around and she thought, why whenever, a group of elephants is kind of near, I feel like there's an earthquake, even when they're not moving around. I, I, I feel like there's some very subtle earthquake happening. <laughs> well, um, she did some experiments and, uh, and a lot of these elephants looked like they were just standing around, but really they were having entire conversations that we just couldn't hear because they were so low that our ears are not made for that. For, for hearing sounds that low. And the entire time that they were standing there, they were having lots of conversations. Isn't that amazing? Okay, next animal, M mouse or rat. Both creatures do this next thing I'm about to tell you. Even though they're kind of, ew, they're kind of yucky when they're in your house, they do cool stuff because they're a creation of God. And so of course they do cool stuff. But um, in a recent experiment, uh, scientists realized that they made a chirping sound, a unique chirping sound that was also very, very high, way too high for our normal ears to hear, but they recorded it and then fig figured it out. Um, um, they would make a, a unique chirping sound when the mouse was in a playful mood or when the mouse was being tickled. Who thought about tickling a mouse? what's going on? It's so weird. But they would, t whenever they would tickle the mouse or put a new fun little device in their cage, they would make this unique chirping sound. And then the scientists are saying, are they laughing? Is that how mice laugh? Do animals laugh? So we're starting to think about this. So scientists are starting to think about this. I wonder if when you guys grow up, you could be scientists who figure out if other animals laugh. And then this beautiful creature is a 
carrot or a macaw. Look at those rainbow colors. God did that. Aren't they amazing rainbow colors? They're just, it's like not even real, but it's, it is real. Well, I just learned a new thing about these guys. Um, did you know that parrots, as well as dolphins, actually, that's a side note, but parrots, as well as dolphins, name their babies after they hatch. So when a baby macaw hatches, the parents um, give each one of their babies a unique sound, and for the rest of their life, that bird has that name and they call each other by their names and they um know their own name they like you know maybe um when they enter the flock they announce their name when they're looking for some when they're looking for someone they say their friend or sibling's name isn't that interesting so you can look it up on youtube <laughs> they, they've been doing lots of uh, research on this Okay, my last animal picture. What is this strange creature? A dog. Put up your hand if you have a dog. Or is your dog funny? Does your dog ever do funny things? If your dog is like my dog, your dog does lots of funny things. My dog oh, is always making me laugh and get very annoyed, but that's okay. Um, dogs are, 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 are amazing too. Amazing creatures of God. Um, I, a cool dog fact that I learned recently is that dogs, a dog's sense of smell is 10,000 to 100,000 times better than a human smells. So dogs could probably, you know, smell a piece of food from a few blocks away or, so, yeah, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't exactly know how that works, but I know dogs can follow their nose there over many, many miles, way more sensitive than human noses. So that's cool. So I think I've made my point. God is a brilliant inventor, an artist who loves colors, and the creator who loves surprising us with new and wonderful things. I do also believe that God has a very good sense of humor. Thank you, God, for giving us things to laugh at, things to enjoy, and things to delight us. You are an amazing creator, and we love you, and we thank you. Amen. Bye. Okay, you can all stay up here just a minute. You guys have done so great at bringing in money for the children's Bible programs in uh, Argentina. I've just totally lost count. I think you've, you've far surpassed the $40. So today, you are lucky ones. You can each come and take one Rice Krispie treat to celebrate uh, your good offering work. Thank you. Keep bringing in the money, because we'll keep collecting it for Argentina children. Somehow the job of mouse tickler has never made it into our career days at school. I'd, I'd like to investigate that a little bit more. I think that's an untapped area. As always, children ages two to five, you guys are dismissed for some supervised child care. And our offering this morning is going to the Mennonite Mission Network. Um, and as our tradition, you can leave your offering with us in one of many of the offering plates here in the church or you can donate online. But please bow with me in prayer as we bless the offering. Thank you, Lord, for Mennonite Mission Network and the work they do in your name. Bless our gifts as they meet needs and fulfill work near and far in your kingdom. May we be a light and a gift to those in need. Amen. We have a little bit of an art history lesson for you this morning. Let's get our uh, picture of Thomas up on the screen. There it is. This is by Caravaggio. He was an Italian painter who was painting around the turn of the 17th century, so about 1600. 
And he is known for being revolutionary in his artistic style, particularly in his depiction of biblical characters. For one thing, instead of depicting biblical characters in an idealized way with perfect glowing bodies, Caravaggio pulled in models from the lower peasant classes to pose for his paintings. So you can see Thomas and the other disciples in this painting have wrinkles, they have shaggy beards, even a little bit of torn clothing. The clothing is also typical of the average clothing worn in Caravaggio's day. So the modern day equivalent of this painting would have Jesus and Thomas in torn blue jeans. The gritty realism of Caravaggio's paintings angered the Catholic Church because they did not believe Caravaggio treated his painted biblical characters with enough reverence. But as you might imagine, the common population of Caravaggio's time loved his paintings. He made the biblical stories feel real and relatable and never shied away from going for the emotional jugular. I also can't help but wonder if Caravaggio didn't approach his paintings with a touch of playful humor. Who remembers the old poke feature on Facebook? When I look at this work of the befuddled Thomas poking at Jesus' side, something makes me wonder if the humor of poking someone isn't just inherent to the human psyche. So we will keep this painting up as we read from the scripture text and hear from Pastor Luke. Our scripture this morning is taken from 1 John chapter 20, uh, verse 19. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house <clears throat> where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails in the side, my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out on your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt and believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. Okay, here we are. Another Saturday evening where I am sitting and writing my sermon. You know, I wonder if this is the quietest time in a pastor's house, you know when they are contemplating their sermon, prepping for Sunday morning. But usually for me, as I mostly finish my sermons earlier in the week so I can be super loud at 10 on a Saturday night, well, I also continue that loudness as I sleep when I snore like a chainsaw fighting a grizzly bear driving a bulldozer. <laughs> but 
I digress. Well, what should we talk about? I guess it would make sense to focus on the Scripture passage. Well, it's also holy humor. Oh, this will be fun. Um, yeah, it's Holy Humor Sunday. Let's start looking at some jokes here. Uh, well, maybe I have some personal jokes or funny stories. Maybe I could tell about my recent travel. Well, let me practice it and see what it sounds like. <clears throat> The past three days, I was in Michigan for a short pastor's retreat and learning event for my transition to leadership program put on by AMBS. Me and some other pastors flew into O'Hare International Airport in Chicago and rented a car from there to drive three hours into southern Michigan. Our flight back was scheduled for 4.59 Central Daylight Time out of O'Hare. We concluded in Michigan at 12.30, But it wasn't a huge problem because we had an extra hour, as Michigan is Eastern time. So we had five and a half hours to get to the airport. Plenty of time, right? We go and finish packing and hit the road by one o'clock. We plan on stopping for lunch in South Bend, Indiana. But realizing the time and how close we were cutting it, we decided just to get some fast food and eat in the car. As the driver of the car, I was pulling up my map to see where we need to go and how long it's gonna take We need to drop off one of the pastors off in Chicago, where he would be staying for a few more days. And so the estimated time for his drop-off is 3 o'clock. Okay, well, no problem, right? That's two hours. We start driving, and as a guy from rural Kansas, I figured, how hard can it be driving in Chicago? (laughs) They have interstates where you can go fast, so it shouldn't be a problem. Well, since I am a Kansan, I realized that the closer we got into the downtown area, the more I severely underestimated traffic in the U.S.'s third largest city. We pull up and to the drop-off spot at around 3.15. Okay, we still have time, but I was starting to get nervous. O'Hare is a large airport, and it might take a while to walk around, but it's not too far away. We should be fine. I put in the address for the airport into my map. 45 minutes crud. Okay, we're going to be pushing it now. I get into the rental car drop-off, run inside for the train, and of course, right when I get there, the doors close. So I'm like, that's okay. There's another one coming. So about three minutes later, I get on the next one and ride for about 10 minutes to my terminal, Terminal 2. I walk down, and of course, there's a long line for security. I get in line, check my time again, 425. Oh no, we might miss our flight that takes off in 30 minutes. We look around and see that boarding will start in 10 minutes at 4.35, but it will end at 4.25. We only have 20 minutes. This line better get moving. Get to the line, take out all my electronics, empty my pockets, take off all my shoes and belt, get through security, but as I'm putting my shoes on, it's 4.45, I grab all my stuff and start walking as fast as I can to our gate, probably 400 yards away, with both bags and my belt in hand. As I'm walking, pants are starting to slip down, but we get to the gate and are the last to board as they shut the door right behind us. On the plane, I put my bag in the overhead and it's tight in the plane, so I also put my belt up there. So we made our flight, but it was way too close to comfort. But now I can say that I've literally flown by the seat of my pants as they were almost falling down. Nah, I don't think that story's funny enough. I won't tell it tomorrow. (laughs) Let me Google some jokes. Jokes, okay. Um, Oh, here we go. What month of the year has 28 days? All of them. (laughs) Well, that's more of a fact than a joke. Why does a hummingbird hum a song? Because it doesn't know the words. Why do melons get married in church? Because they cantaloupe. (laughs) What kind of shoes do frogs wear? Open toed. Okay. How do you stop a bull from charging? Cancel its credit card. Well, these are all good, but if it's holy humor, shouldn't I get some church jokes? What was Moses' wife, Zipporah, known as when she'd throw dinner parties. The hostess with the Moses. 
And what kind of car does Jesus drive? A Chrysler. Mm, these are cheesy. Okay, here we go. So a girl and her mother ran into their priest at the store. The girl told the priest that they were getting ready for Easter. Seeing a teaching opportunity, the priest replied, Oh, really? Do you know what Easter's all about? The girl looked a little offended. Of course I do. So when Jesus went to Jerusalem on a donkey and he got in trouble and they nailed him on a cross and then he died. They put him in a tomb with a big rock in front of it. But three days later, the rock was rolled away. That's great, said the priest, pleased to know that the Sunday school program worked so well. But that's not all, said the girl. When the rock gets rolled back, Jesus steps out and looks around. And so on Easter, if he sees his shadow, there's six more weeks of winter. <laughs> well, okay. Well, these are interesting. I might have to use some of them, but it wouldn't make a good sermon just to tell jokes the whole time. Maybe I should look into the origins of what holy humor is, how it's based off of the Rhesus Piscalis, the Easter laugh. Eh, Laura's going to cover that tomorrow, so maybe I shouldn't. Um, well, today in the church, it's often called Low Sunday because of the generally low attendance. <laughs> After all, everyone came last week and heard the biggest story of all, so church can be crossed off the to-do list for a while. Anyway, maybe I should focus on the joy and the love and the laughter and just all-around good vibes of today. After all, the gospel does mean good news. And then I could encourage the congregation to play harmless practical jokes on each other. Oh, that'll be good. That'll be good. I'll look forward to that. I could talk, well, yeah, I could talk about how the Bible is full of many puns and there's a lot of plays on words that don't translate well into English, so we kind of miss out on not reading the scripture in its original language. Although I am in Hebrew now, and I'm not quite sure I've laughed once. <laughs> if anything, I've gotten mad. Maybe I just need more practice. But I also believe that with much of the time, sometimes we think God can't have a sense of humor, that the Bible is a very respectable document, which, which it is, right? And Christians are only supposed to be somber around it. But... I think in my own looking, I can see there's all sorts of ridiculous situations that take place, right? People are turning into salt, and others are getting swallowed by giant fishes. And did you know that the first book of Samuel, God afflicts the Philistines with hemorrhoids when they steal the Ark of the Covenant? Oh, here it says, in 1 Kings, Elijah suggests that the reason the pagan gods aren't showing up to take care of the people is because the pagan gods are defecating? Oh, and then the story about all the camels, right? Three camels try to board Noah's Ark, and Noah stops them. Hey, only two of each animal are allowed. One of you will have to stay ashore. First camel says, not me, I'm the camel so many people swallow while straining the gnat from their soup. Second camel says, I'm the camel whose back is broken by the last straw. The third camel says, and I'm the camel who shall pass through the eye of a needle sooner than the rich man shall enter the kingdom of heaven. So Noah, deciding the Bible wouldn't make any sense without them, lets them all come aboard. Man, these are all great, but again, you can't feel a whole sermon that way. I should probably apply the scriptures somehow. Well... Look in here, it's, it's, these verses are directly following what Pastor Laura preached on last week. So let me, let me try and walk through it a bit. So at this point, the women told the disciples about Christ's resurrection, to which they locked themselves in a room. Why? Probably fear of prosecution from the authorities. Someone who was literally dead, proclaimed to be alive again. Someone who they loved and trusted died just mere days earlier, and now they are told he was walking and talking, but with extra holiness. Hmm. In this scene, were they just sitting in silence, playing games maybe? What were they doing in this fear? But then in, in that evening, on that Easter evening, Jesus stood among them, and it's interesting that the door is locked. How did Jesus get in? It just says Jesus gets in. Jesus says, peace be with you. Nice. He also showed them the holes in his body, on his hands and on his side. Jesus again says, peace. The disciples 
were probably completely filled with awe and fear. How could this be possible? It also mentions here in the text that he gave them the Holy Spirit, bringing together Pentecost on this day. Interesting. Well, as we continue on, it says Thomas wasn't with the disciples. Maybe he was in the bathroom. Maybe he was nervous, taking a walk maybe. Disciples told Thomas that they saw God, and Thomas said, well, pictures or it didn't happen. Thomas said, I need to see his hands and his side. Thomas doubted their testimony. I mean, they were still in the room even after Jesus appeared to them. So no wonder he didn't believe them at first. Again, Jesus appeared again to the disciples a week later. This time, Tom was with them. Jesus asked Thomas to put his hand in his side. And so Thomas believed so much now, he was just in awe. Maybe I'll show a picture of Caravaggio and that it was of Thomas that Caravaggio painted. Okay, let me send that to Alex for tomorrow for the projection. Okay, well, who said that? <laughs> Can we do a skit maybe for my sermon? That would take up a few minutes. Let me look for some. Okay, here, here is a skit. It's with an interviewer and with Thomas. Cynics say there are only two certainties in life, death and taxes. But I think there are some other certainties that many, if not all of us, live by. Try these on for size. I'm certain that tomorrow the sun will rise. I'm certain that if I push this laptop off the edge, it will fall. Even in the spite of the bizarre weather this past winter, I was always certain that the following winter would come. I'll never believe it without putting my finger in the nail marks and my hand in the spear wound. Who do you think that is? Yes, that is doubting Thomas. When Jesus finally appears to Thomas a week after the resurrection, Jesus grants Thomas' demand. Jesus says, take your finger, examine my hands, put your hand in my side. Don't persist in your unbelief. Do not doubt. Thomas, you receive a lot of bad press down through the years. <clears throat> I do. At least one the theologian writes, and I quote, The stupidity of Thomas is astonishing, is monstrous. Thomas is not only obstinate, but also proud and contemptuous in his treatment of Christ. Ooh, gosh, that's harsh. Yet, even today, we warn each other not to be a doubting Thomas. Indeed. But there's more to the story than that. So it seems. John does write in his gospel that you are the disciple who asked Jesus to show you the way to our creator. And you are the one who boldly says to his fellow disciples, let us go that we may die with him, with Jesus. You may be doubtful, but you seem to truly follow Jesus. Why does John write these good things of you in the gospel, even as he shares this unfavorable story of your, well, your terrible doubt? I don't think that John opposes doubt. In fact, I think by telling my story, John is showing that a healthy amount of doubt can help strengthen and mature one's faith. He writes to assure the church of my day and the church of your day that doubt is okay. Doubt is okay? My Google search says that doubt is the opposite of faith, that doubt Distrust, disbelief, all oppose faith. What do you mean doubt is okay? Well, what I mean is doubt is a part of faith and not necessarily the enemy of faith or the opposite of faith as your Google search claims. If you picture faith as a gem, like a diamond, doubt is one of the facets, one of the facets of our faith. One could even say it adds value to the diamond, to faith rather than to mar it. You know, I, I like that image of faith being like a precious stone with different facets. I overheard you earlier talking to the congregation about certainties. Certainty, like doubt, is a facet of faith, a facet on the face of the diamond. 
A healthy amount of certainty is definitely good for us. A reasonable dose of certainty is a good thing, something we can live by. For example, it is good to know that if you step off the ledge of a high cliff, it is certain that you will fall. Right, but are you suggesting that a person can have too much certainty? That certainty can be a bad thing? Absolutely. You seem quite certain about that. <laughs> I am as certain as can be. Well, what, I mean, what are some examples that you have? I'm not quite following what you mean here. Um, Taylor and Travis? Oh. <laughs> they were in the press all the time. People couldn't get enough. And they are finally out of the forefront, and the, and the press can relax a bit. Hmm. Our children and youth speaking up about impending climate change. This is the generation that will be affected most by it, and they have to have the most influence. How about right here, in this place? You all have had some challenging conversations. I know many of you worry what good, if any, will come from them. But if there's one thing I've learned from Jesus, it's that good news appears in the most surprising times and places. I'm sure you all can think of other examples where it was hard to believe that good things can happen. You know, I begin to see here how a dose of doubt can actually free us to receive new faith, new truths, like the truth of the resurrection. Yeah. My fa a favorite hymn of mine says, Time makes ancient truths uncouth. Time makes ancient truths old and worn out like the truths I held before Jesus' death and resurrection. That's what happened to me with Jesus. You mean your doubt in the resurrected Jesus? Thomas isn't very prepared for this. His skit might be out of order. <laughs> Oh, my pages seem out of order. <laughs> Is this the page we're on? Yeah, you skipped all this, though. Oh. Huh? <laughs> oh, this page is backwards. Here. All right, perfect. Yeah, great. <laughs> Wait, so <clears throat> you mean your doubt in the resurrected Jesus? I just could not reconcile the truth I held in my head of God's perfection with the fact that Jesus had been wounded and killed, betrayed, abandoned, whipped, and hung on a cross to die. How could such a thing happen to God's own beloved son, God's special chosen one? Yeah, reports of Jesus... Resurrection left you filled with distrust, disbelief, and... Go ahead and say it. I was left filled with... Doubt? Yes, filled with doubt. My absolutes, my certainties were put into question. But then, when the risen Jesus appeared and showed me wounded hands, feet, and sides, I could only cry out and confess, My Savior! My God! Now my faith is even stronger. Wow. What a testimonial. Certainly led to doubt, and doubt lead, led to greater faith. Well, thank you, Thomas, for, for sharing with us this morning. Let's all, let's all pray together. God, as we travel through life's valleys and the places of darkness and despair, we know that you are with us. Even when life's doubts assail us, we know that you still abide with us, watching over us. Strengthen our faith. Shape it with healthy doses of doubt and certainty so that we are always ready to receive good news from you. In your love, hear our prayer. Amen. Well, thank you, Thomas. Appreciate thank you. it. Hmm. I like that skit. I think it flowed pretty well, except that part I got lost in the middle, but who would play Thomas tomorrow? Maybe Case and Schmidt? Eh, we'll see. 
It's kind of last minute. I would have to ask him to help in the morning, which I definitely will not do, even if he would be willing to help out last minute and run through it at 9.15 with me. (laughs) But Thomas, what can I say about him? How can I... What are some main points I can really cover on this scripture? Well, well, what about this? Let me type it up here. Jesus showed, us, showed up to the disciples who were very afraid. They were extremely fearful, and, and for good reason. They were following a man who was going against Jewish code, who was challenging authority both in faith and in the empire. But Jesus offers them peace, and they rejoice. Peace be with you. A greeting we all know well. But it wasn't easy for them to hear then. I mean, it's easy for us to laugh and have joy around this story because we know the final ending. But the disciples believed it. They might have had visions of what was coming next for them in the years to follow, but that didn't matter. Because Jesus, the man that they came to believe was the Messiah, was standing in front of them in the flesh. They felt the peace of God. They felt the joy, and they probably laughed together. That all was coming true of what Jesus had proclaimed. Thomas had doubted, but that is okay. It is okay for us to doubt. We are human, just like Thomas was. And we also believe in the resurrected Christ, shown to us last Sunday in such a joyous way of Easter. Doubt is the pathway to faith. When we doubt, we probe, question, and search. Perhaps Thomas started with doubt, but he ended with the greatest testimony of the disciples. Easter continues this week and every week because we know that God conquered death. God defeated the enemy through the resurrection of Christ. Let us rejoice. Let us dance and sing and laugh and play and be merry because Christ is risen. Then the congregation will say, Christ is risen indeed. Okay. Wow. Oh my goodness, it's already one o'clock. I better get to bed. I do have a good start here, so I'll put the finishing touches on before church tomorrow. Okay, well, yeah, that'll work. Well, amid the laughter and celebration of this day, it is also good to pause and remember that many carry burdens that need not be carried alone. We want to remember in our prayers Deb Ratzloff and her family on the passing of her mother, Bess Hoxman. We also want to remember Casa Batania and especially Perla Gonzalez and her family as they grieve the loss of Perla's 10-year-old son, Elios Gonzalez. Uh, Many of you may remember Elios uh, would join Casa Batania for some of our joint worship services and our meals downstairs. He was often in in a um, large wheelchair um, carrier, and so we want God's love and care to surround the Casa Batania community in this time. Let's pray together. God of grace, God of love and laughter, we thank you that we are so wondrously created and that we are made for relationship with you and with one another. We thank you for laughter with friends and loved ones. We thank you for the laughter of children and the song it creates in our hearts. By your unending love, you inspire in us a spirit of imagination and creativity. 
Help us to use that spirit to play more, to laugh more, and to create beauty in every way possible. Remind us to laugh out loud, for doing so will heal some of the wounds within us. Not all, but some. God, we pray for those who cannot find their laughter today, for those who are grieving or suffering illness of body, mind, or spirit, for those who are lonely and in need of someone to share their time and friendship, for those who have not yet moved into the season of Easter and find themselves still living in Good Friday. May these and all the troubles of your people be soothed, blessed, and comforted by your holy presence. May we each find the laughter within us that sets our spirits free. And in that freedom, may we take your love into every part of our lives. These and all the prayers of our hearts we offer now in the name of Jesus, our Lord of laughter, and Savior of the world. Amen. song of response is called Take Time to Be Funny. It is to the tune of Be Thou My Vision. I spent most of the week believing that Pastor Laura wrote it. <laughs> I found out this morning that she didn't, but I, I, I choose to still think of it as being something she came up with. <laughs> well, and I, I had a little story I'd like to tell too. I'll make it. I'll make it brief though, and because we've been talking about such great spiritual leaders and and people of faith, and my story is actually about Mahatma Gandhi, who was known as a, a great spiritual man, who uh, was also known for living very simply and humbly, who who uh, walked great distances, like going to the sea to make make salt out of seawater. Um, you know, and so, of, of course, going barefoot, he would have a lot of calluses built up on his feet so he could handle a journey like that. And, uh, but his health wasn't always really good, and since he didn't have access to a lot of the um, modern conveniences like toothbrushes and things like that, he was known to have bad breath, too. So he was, um, so he had calluses, he wasn't real strong. Um, he was a spiritual man, and he had bad breath. Would so, that make him a super calloused, fragile, fragile, mystic, vexed, vexed with, with halitosis? halitosis? Super fragile, mystic, hexed with halitosis. Super fragile, hexed with halitosis. Okay, we better sing now. Uh, feel free to join us if you want. Time to be funny, rejoice in the Lord, let laughter explode and have fun with God's word. For laughter is healing, gives strength to the weak. God loves to see smiles, for they lift up the mean. Take time to be silly, it's good for the soul. Sarah and Abram, a child they lacked. God's angels promised, and she birthed Isaac. 
In Hebrew, that's laughter. Go check if you want. Genesis 17 is where it is found. Before humor is holy, it sanctifies life. Replenishes hope and off softens advice. It undercuts sorrow, deflates haughty pride. So smile and hang on and rejoice in life's ride. Now is the time for announcements and sharing. If there's any, please come forward. Okay, who's interested in supporting MCC, Mennonite Central Committee? Stand up if you're interested. I want to just see who is interested in supporting MCC. Because we have opportunities. First of all, 4 o'clock this afternoon, Mem Hall, Mennonite Men's Chorus. We sing so we can donate the proceeds of our program to MCC. You may sit down. There's 279 volunteer positions for the Kansas Mennonite Relief Sale. Where does that money go? MCC. We're still looking for pies to be baked. I know our Sunday school class is going to be doing some of those, but there's still plenty of pie pans for others as well. Where does that money go? MCC. So if you are interested, as you all said you are, in supporting MCC, get on the website and volunteer, do some baking, go listen to some great music this afternoon, it all goes to support MCC. And no joke, just last week I read that MCC actually was able to get a truckload of supplies into the Gaza Strip. So we are talking about real lives being affected. Thank you. Ryan Kane, church moderator, and just want to draw your attention to the spring congregational meeting that's coming up on April 21st. We'll have our carry-in meal, and then the meeting will start about 12.30 or as soon as we can after uh, the meal's done. And we'll take action on two items. One is uh, approval of the audit report, financial audit report, and then also um, the 2023 financial report. Now back to the uh, carry-in meal. I was uh, pretty bummed on Wednesday when I didn't get any pork chops. They went a little rich for my blood. Um, I don't know. I even, I even put my hand up a couple times, but th this went too high. But during thinking about this announcement, it dawned on me, wouldn't it be great if all of you that purchased those redonated them to our carrion meal? <laughs> and I got really excited. So I, I prefer mine over charcoal with a little bit of kosher salt and a little coarse pepper on top. <laughs> I mean, the salt and pepper do it for me. So no, no mar marinade required. So now I'm really excited for the 21st. I was excited before, but pork chops just took me over the edge. There is a sympathy card on the tall table in the welcoming area for anyone to sign for Perla and her family. Um, I told her that people at First Mennonite were praying for them, and I'm sure she would be happy for that card. Also, I just wanted to say that one of the things she wanted yesterday was yellow balloons in the room. Um, she said that Elios always responded to balloons and that in Mexico, yellow is a color that represents inclusion of people with disabilities. Elios had cerebral palsy and uh, she took care of him lovingly throughout uh, his life. And um, it's a, you know, a huge change for her and uh, 
a huge loss. And so please be praying for Perla and uh, her family. The, uh, he died in hospice at uh, St. Francis, and they allowed us to be there with the body for six hours. And it was a real holy time of uh, singing and praying and sharing scripture and hugging and crying. And a uh, very, very meaningful time for Casa Batania people together with their extended family and friends. So thank you. Good morning. Um, you should find a sheet like this in your mailbox um, today. Um, it's announcing that our church is participating in the next Trex Recycling Challenge. The challenge comes from the Trex Company, which manufactures outdoor decking and furniture from recycled plastic. The goal is to turn 1,000 pounds, or half a ton, of recycled plastic film in the next year. It's a large quantity of plastic to keep out of our landfill. What's more, if we meet this goal, the Trex Company will give our church a free outdoor bench made from recycled plastic. Here's how to participate. On one side of the paper is some basic information about the recycling program, and on the other side are two lists, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. Please read and follow it carefully, even though, the Trex recycle, even though Trex recycles plastic bags that other recycling programs can't use, they still can use only certain kinds of plastics. We sort, the two of us have been sorting through all the plastic that has come in before we submit it for recycling. The closer that people follow these lists, the quicker our sorting goes and the less stuff we have to put in the trash. Some really great news is that our church has some help reaching our goal. Whitestone Mennonite in Heston already has earned two benches, and they will start collecting again in August for a third one. Until then, they're giving us their plastic that they collect. Etc. Shop in Newton just met their goal a couple weeks ago, and they're also giving us their plastic that they collect. And the same with the Heston Library. So even before our church's start date, we had a lot of plastic from those friends. We've already submitted 138 pounds toward our 1,000 goal. There is a collection box and poster along the north wall of the gathering area. We've ordered several more collection boxes like it and we'll let you know their locations after they arrive. If you have questions, please ask either one of us and if you would like to help us collect and sort plastic, please let us know that too. It's, it's kind of a big job that we've undertaken. But it's kind of fun too. A toy hunk? <laughs> Try again. Hank, toy you? You almost there. Try one more time. Oh, thank you. Uh, yes, as the youth group, we want to say thank you so much for your support this past Wednesday for all the money and donations that were given for our auction. Uh, we, we, we raised just under $9,400 that will help us to go towards our summer trip at, to Kentucky, where we will be participating in Appalachia Build, formerly Swap, with MCC. So we're excited for that. That'll be the second week of July. So again, thank you, thank you, thank you for all your donations.
I would also like to make another announcement. Next Sunday, uh, Open Road will be singing here. Uh, and so we would like to invite uh, all other college students or young adults between 18 and 23, 24, whatever you decide. We'd, we'd invite them to a lunch tomorrow downstairs. Um, spread the word to everyone you know uh, who fits that age group, young adults. Um, we'll be having a lunch downstairs following the service. So spread the word. I'll send some stuff out, but uh, we invite all those there. Thank you. As our time together comes to a close, let's all remember to focus on the joy, the miracle of Easter, and all the things that Christ's rising does for us. This is where God wants us, in joy, and this is where we do our best work, with joy. Go ahead and stand if you're able for the sending song, This Little Light. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. 